Are you in the countryside, or whereabouts are you? Well, I, it's uh, it's called Aberfeldy. Uh -huh. So Aberfeldy is a, a town uh, in the middle of a, a valley, sort of uh, uh, kind of in the middle of Scotland. You know what? It's like right at the foot of the Highlands. Okay. So like if Scotland's a dartboard, yeah, Aberfeldy is pretty much bullseye. We went through Edinburgh, and Edinburgh is just the coolest, the coolest city, isn't it? It's like something out of Hogwarts. I mean, it's just you go and you just say, if if only I could have just been a student here, you know, if I could have right. had my had my classes in this city. I had my first haggis while I was there. It was uh, it was a good a good experience. It was a lot of fun. You know what? Any city that has a castle on a mountain in the middle yeah. of it has nothing to prove to anybody. You know, it's just nothing you know, to prove. Just, it's you know. Edinburgh and Transylvania, and I think that's it. You know, when I first come up here, I was living in London for seven years, and I come up here uh, on a bit of a busman's holiday. You know, I'd been asked to do a gig, uh, but they were going to put me up in a in the white tower up here, or whatever. And I, I when I come up for the gig. I told everyone, I'm moving here. It took me two <laughs> years. It took you just it knew. took me two years, but I knew. I just knew just the yeah. stillness of it. You know, it was everything I was looking for uh, after London because London was just such a sort of rat race, especially you know for you know I was what you know thirty five, thirty six. You know, mm -hmm. just a jobbing singer songwriter yeah, yeah. out yeah, up and down sure. the country. So so like to to really kind of keep the London dream alive. I was having to work, you know, just. Right. Or, you know, take any gig I could to try and right. pay for this dream, this life I couldn't afford, type thing. Uh, so when I saw this, it was like I saw exactly what you're saying—the new possibilities, yeah. the kind of yeah. stillness, the time to think, the time to unpack. You know, and maybe that is something that happens like when you hit thirty-five or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was all about the noise. I just wanted give me chaos, give me endless distractions. That's why I loved a city like London. That's why I, when I finally visited New York after growing up in Los Angeles, I was like, "Oh, this is this is the, this is the rhythm to my drum. This is what I want." Mm. And and I was constantly stimulated, and I was I was always tasting new foods and meeting new people and seeing new art. And and but it was but it was you know when you finally find yourself in peace and quiet, you realize just how much that's that's hitting you every day, the grind of it every day. Um, and I was working harder than I'd ever worked in my life. And, um, and now whenever I go, my parents, you know, uh, live on an island in Washington state half the year. And, you know, and I just, every time I get to visit somewhere where it's just nothing off the grid, nature, peace and quiet, you can hear your own thoughts, which is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. that scared me before and it doesn't, it doesn't scare me anymore. Now it feels like, oh yeah, that's the meaning of life right there. And that's just. Yeah, well, listen, Maybe. when you're in your 20s and you hear your own thoughts, it just sounds like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Right? <laughs> you don't no. want to hear too many of your own thoughts in your 20s. No, no, yeah. it's, it's time to just kind of just do, just keep going, just keep trucking, keep the wheels on the so. road. I was on tour um, when uh, the quarantine started to sort of soft happen. People were starting to say, well, we're not in quarantine, but it's probably a good idea. And concerts were starting, the trickle effect of starting to cancel. There was this weird time period in like February when people who were on the road were just kind of starting to like call their managers and tour managers being like, uh, the news is getting worse. Do we do the show tonight? Do we not? Do we, you know? And so that was, I, I so I, I, I left, I was in Florida, which, which, uh, you know, now that I look at what's happening in Florida, I mean, I'm gl so glad that we did the right thing and, and, and left because I didn't want to put my fans in any kind of risk there. Um, and that was a, that was a slower burn in Florida to, to get to um, a higher rate of uh, infect, infection. But, but we, but I, I, I had just gotten a place in LA cause I knew I was going to be here for a while, but had really no furniture in it. So I came back from Florida and just, I've, I'm, as I'm talking to you, I have a mattress on the floor and uh, a Nintendo Switch, and that's about all I have to my name right Living now. The now. Dream, Living the Living dream, baby. Living the dream. Living the dream. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, and thinking, you know, remember when they said, oh, it'll be a few weeks. Yeah. It'll be a few weeks, and I'm thinking, okay, all right. But but it's different where you are than it is where I am. I mean, we're not figuring this out right now. We are we are back in a never, we're kind of in a never mind, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody shut down again kind of thing, which psychologically is really 
very taxing for us here in America. Well, listen, we, it is happening here too. I mean, I think, I, I, well, it, it does feel to me, not to be pessimistic, but it does feel to me like a second wave is imminent here because mm-hmm. they are opening up again, um, you know, and not but a few weeks ago, there was like 30,000 people on Bournemouth Beach or something, you know, because mm-hmm. it was a sunny day and everyone was like, ah, fuck it, we're going out. We're, That's we're, the this, thing. Fuck and this, I'm getting too. out of the house, you know psychologically we're just also over it and now that it's summer yeah. and now that we have kind of like one holiday weekend after another you know it's like holding the hands of children saying well you are sort of allowed to go but be careful will you just please mm-hmm. promise us you'll be careful well of course 90 percent of people can be careful but the other 10 percent are going to mess it up for everybody else so you know it's um yeah but and even the 90 percent these... after two pints will be fucking it up like the rest that's of true them. that's why we close you know the mean? bars down again because mm-hmm. because of course Alcohol makes you take your mask off. Yeah. You start snuggling with your common man, and then... (laughs) I love you, buddy. Fuck Corona. (laughs) Fuck Corona. Come here, you. Why don't you sing that song we love loudly to my face like we used to? (laughs) The one about suffer and suck it. Just uh, get it in there. Go ahead. Get it in there. I, I don't hear it as well unless there's your saliva is in every orifice in my body. Yeah. Have you found <laughs> Have you found that doing a, a podcast about a Last Supper uh, d- just feels kind of feels particularly ominous? When did you start it? When did you start this concept? Uh, do you know what? Not but a few months ago, really. I I, I did. Oh, so six... this has been this has been this has been right. At the start of everybody kind of feeling like the world is ending. Yeah, I I don't know. It's a weird thing, isn't it? To kind of, uh, I I suppose I just wanted to be chatting to people now that yeah. I'm not on the road. You know what I mean? To kind of catch up with folks and see what's going on. You know, I found myself, you know, over a a glass of uh, what was it, uh, Lagavulin or something last night, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of thinking about. Ooh, what would I eat? What would I listen to? And I just, I found myself getting a little dark, boy. I started, found myself getting a little, uh, like, man, yeah, I don't know, though, if that's the last thing I hear. I don't know if I want something that's... Uh, and I thought, no, you know what? Just keep it light. I'm going to keep it light. And, uh... We could just have a meal, but the world doesn't have the end. But I guess, you know, here was, here was the thing for me. We are all going to die. Yeah. We, we all, whether we're going to die or not, need to eat food along the way. And we all, in, in my opinion, need music. I thought long and hard about it. I really did. Oh, well, that's good. Because I just did one with Benny Blanco. And his meal, his meal was like, you know, I, I want to get I want to get fries and burgers and then oysters and scampi and fish and chips and curries. And, you know, and I want to listen to Kanye and Prince and, you know, and he goes through, you know. Benny is living his best life and he is going to die his best death. So tell me then, what's your starter? My starter, okay. So I actually started, you know what I started doing, Foy, is I started coming up with a song, because I'm an overthinker. If you know, I mean, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time on tour together. I, I, it takes a lot for me to let loose. Unless I start with a really strong cocktail, I, I'm, over gonna, I'm gonna overthink this, this, uh, this uh, challenge. So um, I, I thought to myself, well, all right, I, I, chose the, I chose the appetizer based on the song I would listen to during the appetizer. It's very meta. So I would, I would, since we are in summer, and I've been making this a lot, and I've been learning a lot about farming, and I've been learning a lot about just organic vegetables and fruits, and like the simplicity of like not having to mess with food too much, just let the ingredients mm-hmm. do the talking. I would just do like a, a really chunky, fresh, like summer vegetable salad, crisp, like good lettuces, corn, zucchini, carrots, like just all this great stuff. And then I would put on, um, really, truly, there's no wrong time to listen to this song, but it's a song called Vegetables by the Beach Boys. And it is one of their strangest, most acid trippy songs that they ever recorded. And they're, you know, they're like, crunch, 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 eat it up, eat it up, nom, you know. And it's so weird. He's like, I'm red as a beat because I'm so embarrassed. It's bonkers. And I would just wow. chomp, chomp, chomp on my vegetable salad and listen to Vegetables by the Beach Boys. And it, truly, at that point, I'd be fine to end it all. What all are you going to put in that salad now? You're in L.A. You could, you could really spice that salad up. You're oh. going out anyway. 
one of the things I've been loving to do here is I've been loving like supporting local farms. And so like rather than just getting delivery like every day, um, I'm able to kind of go on these various websites where they'll buy from a local farm that needs support. You then buy from them. They're the middleman. And you just get like a box of fresh produce put on the front of your door. Mm. Nothing else, just fresh fruits and vegetables. And so as somebody who's kind of like, I'm trying to kind of get better at, at my culinary uh, skills in the kitchen. And so I'll just take it out and I'll say, shit, I have a cauliflower, an eggplant, a carrot, and a peach. What do I do with this? You know, and so it kind of forces you to, um, you know, to, to try ingredients you never would have put into something before mm. and to kind of make sure that you make good and quick work of it before it goes bad because you don't want to waste anything. So um, that's been really fun for me. So I would just put, I would put whatever was in my box that week into my salad. It might be a little fruit, might be a little, some nuts, some, some, I mentioned corn. I love corn, especially in the summer. Wow, well, you're an easy going guy, right? This is yeah, like, you can have yeah. anything you want in your final salad and you're like, <laughs> ah, whatever they bring me. Just whatever's, <laughs> just whatever's for it. I'll be, yeah. Do you know what? I'll go with you on the salad. I'll meet you on the salad. I'll, okay. I'll see your salad. Okay. Um, but I'll go a, a Greek salad if it's sunny. Mm. Only if it's sunny, though. Yeah. If I can yeah. control the weather as well as my dinner and the song I listen to. Yeah, yeah. Then that's yeah. great. Okay, then, then, then it's would, sunny. Would you, would you pair it with some nice bazooki Greek music? A little... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I've got this, I've got this, uh, I've got this uh, record, Greek Island music. Oh, uh, and it's just random. I've never. I don't know who. Yeah. I don't know who they are. Who I the love getting that stuff. Whatever. I love getting those yeah. compilation albums from various regions, and because it's mostly traditional music, and, and it just it just takes you there. Yeah, yeah. So I have a Greek salad. I put that album on. I'm no. I know I'm being cheeky. That's more than a song. You only got a song. I get a whole album. I'll just take you're the gonna, first song you're off the record. Really savor that salad. You were gonna. You were gonna listen to seventy three minutes of traditional Greek music. Well, yeah. you just make sure every scrap of feta is taken off of that bowl. I'm just going to I'm going to suck the kalamatas till they just dissolve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what? That, that's that's a pretty good start. But I I'd love to have that with a bit of uh just um bread on the side. And have you ever been to Tony's Taverna? Is it Tony's? Oh Taverna? yeah. Yeah, Taverna Tavern in in uh, Taverna Ta- in Malibu. In, in Malibu, yeah. I used to live in Malibu. I used to go there all the time. Oh, that bread! That bread is really good. And their house dip. Yeah, it's that, not, all that tapenade, yeah. that olive tapenade kind of thing that they do. It's incredible. That yeah, that would be a good starter. It's such a scene, though, when you go to a place like that. That's the thing about Malibu, is that it's just it's so picturesque and beautiful and calming and all the things that we talk about going to the mountains and things like that. You go to Malibu and you just, you feel that. And then you're, and then all of a sudden, um, somebody's paparazzi entourage has walked in, gotten out of their Rolls Royce and, Mm -hmm. you know, start sat down at, at Taverna Tony's and you're just like, Oh yeah, no, I can't even hear. I can't even hear the mandolin anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm covered in crumbs. And now yeah. I just feel and now I just feel anxious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's an incredible place, Malibu. Yeah. Uh, absolutely incredible. You know. It is, but the problem is everybody's discovered that. That's the thing about incredible places is that you got to keep them just ever so slightly a secret. You know, because because my, because David Foster, who was producing me at the time, he lived in Malibu, and Rick Rubin, who was producing me after that, he lived in Malibu. Yeah. And I would have it was was dating somebody at the time who lived in Santa Monica, and it was just. Like all of my existence was like by the beach. And so growing up right in the center of Los Angeles, right in the the middle of the metropolis, all of this time in my early adulthood, spending by the water and by the beach and just kind of making music and singing and being in love and all those things. And it was just all kind of reminded me of what that area was to me. And so I thought when I, when I finally, you know, kind of, you know, got a record deal and all that stuff and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to move out of my parents' house and I'm going to get a place. I thought, you know what? I want to be, I want to be in this place. I feel like I, I want to be in this place that makes me feel this way. Um, it was just lonely because, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately, you know, you, you can't make an album, you know, every year. And relationships sometimes don't last. <laughs> and all of a sudden I found myself in this really picturesque and beautiful place all by myself. And mm-hmm. an hour, an hour from the metropolis, 
And so, you know, Malibu things close like at nine o'clock and I just found myself kind of feeling like very Zen, very happy to be in that nature, but then also just extremely lonely. And so that's kind of when, when I made the pilgrimage from Malibu to like New York, I think I was really craving that, you know, the bounce off of other people. I just was missing that. I think Malibu would be an amazing place to go back to if I had a family and kind of could, could have my own, you know, my own uh, troop there of, of people that I'm with and love. But uh, if you're just by yourself, it's, it's a little out, out of the way. Yeah, it's funny. See, I'm uh, married with three kids, so that sounds yeah. like fucking bliss to me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, if, I've, if I'm ever in the same situation, uh, uh, I, uh, I would probably go back and do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> So what about main course then? What are you having for your main course? I, I wanted it in like a nice summer gazpacho soup. I love a gazpacho soup with like a with a like a big crisp piece of avocado floating right in the top. And I just I love I like I love a spicy gazpacho. And then I <laughs> and then I chose soupy sales as a song. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? This is just you're just trying to be clever now. This isn't this has nothing to do with anything you soupy want to feel sales. on your final day. Soupy sales was like a was like a uh, kind of a slapstick comedian. Uh, I want to say in like the forties. I want to say I'm guessing. Uh, so I just said I just and he all of his songs were jo- weird joke songs. And so I just said your, one of his songs was called "Your Brains Will Fall Out." And so I just said, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna drink gazpacho and uh, listen to Soupy Sales. Your brains will fall out." And that's that's the moment where I I said, Josh, you got to change course. You got to change course here. I. I, <laughs> it's time I to changed. Put, time to put the whiskey away for a second. Time to put the whiskey away. <laughs> Can I tell you? I had as many mid mid podcast preparations crises during this prep work as I've had in my normal all normal crises life. Uh, I, I went all over the place. So the gazpacho soup with soupy sales that goes with the salad, and then I'll listen to vegetables, and your brains will fall out back to back. Yeah, just to keep things loopy. Right at the top, just to yeah. knock me over the head and just keep things weird. Uh, but the main course, all right, so feeling a little rebellious because <laughs> it's my last it's my last meal, so fuck it, eat whatever I want. <laughs> I, I will never forget when my dad took me to, uh, like it was a Denny's or an IHOP at like 5 p.m., 6 p.m. for dinner, and I saw on the menu that you could order breakfast for dinner. And I said, wait, wait, I think we got the breakfast menu. There's pancakes, there's an omelet here. Oh, no, 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 we're at Denny's. You can order breakfast at night. And I'm going, oh, my God. And I'm like nine years old. And I'm thinking, this is the coolest thing I've ever experienced in my life. So I, I actually like eggs, like a, like a breakfasty meal sometimes at night. There's a, there's a restaurant yeah. uh, in Tribeca called The Odeon. They've got a great omelet with French fries that they serve at night. They do that in France quite a bit. So I would do lox. I love lox and eggs. Uh, with some smoked salmon, eggs on toast with a side of baked beans, which I, which I developed my love of breakfast baked beans while I was in London, and uh, some hot sauce. Yeah. And then I would and put like a, like a Cholula or a Tapatio or some kind of um, Mexican hot sauce on top of that. And... Um, and I, I would just, that would be very, very, I would enjoy that very much. Do you know what? You've got me, you've, you've got my juices flowing there, man. I'm are ready, you a breakfast, I'm ready. Are you a breakfast for dinner kind of guy, Foy? Because I, I... Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Who who isn't? Who isn't? You know what? I, I don't think it was, uh, it wasn't Denny's, it was Waffle House or somewhere. Me and Anderson oh, East yeah, went yeah. there one, one morning, like three in the morning. Oh. And just had, like, you know... Well, that's still- everything. There was hash brown. I think we we got huevos rancheros. We just oh had yeah, fantastic big pl- platter of shit. Fantastic three in the morning. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, so I could yeah. Do you know what that, that platter? I could go that again. Yeah, I could have that yeah, for yeah for a, for I, a main course myself I, actually. Breakfast, anyway, what are you, what are you listening to? I didn't particularly. I didn't think of a song. I, after Good, you're on the sale, spot. After, after soupy sales, I was so disgusted with myself. That I just said, it's decided, all right, well, then, then I'll just wing it. Uh, what would I listen to over locks and eggs? Um, I would listen to, um, uh, oh, oh, are you familiar with Future Islands? You ever listen to Future Islands? No. Uh, great band, great band. They've got a song called Seasons, and uh, I would all about seasons changing and uh, 
Uh, it's a it's a it's a great great song, and I love I love this guy's voice. Um, you know, he's uh, oh, less his, than his, his top sure. his top register is like very kind of croony, almost like almost like a nineteen fifties crooner, and then Beautiful. like you you hit like under a certain range in his lower voice, and it almost almost becomes like death metal. Uh, it's it's he's got like pretty 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 <laughs> underneath, what? and it's it's very strange. Um, and uh, what's it is, called again? Future. So so Future Islands is the name of the band, and the right. song is called Seasons. It was kind of one of their big their big hits, and um, and uh, I've always it's a very contemplative song. Like I've always I always said to, I, when I first heard it, I was like, oh yeah, I'd like this at my funeral, or I would like I would I would listen to this in my final moments as I was watching the asteroid you know, the beam towards us. It's got that kind of, it's got that kind of, um, apocalyptic nostalgic feel. I guess I would wow, say if you try is listening, their, their song is, is, is apocalyptic nostalgic is how I would describe that song over my wow. lungs and eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's quite the description today. Have you ever heard a song called long as you know, you're 11 years by Keith Jarrett? Yes. Oh, I love Keith Jarrett. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Oh, Me too. That's a good choice. That's a really good choice. Listen, if I had time, I'd listen to part one of the uh, the Cologne concert, or Cologne concert, however you say. You know, it. you know, I, I saw him perform at uh, Carnegie Hall in New York, and what? it was it was extraordinary watching his mind work. Like you could you could like physically see, I mean, you couldn't actually see, but you could sense yeah. like just the muse beaming into his skull you know mm. there were moments of course with any improvisation where you're like where's he gonna go he doesn't even know where he's gonna go is this mm-hmm. this is carnegie hall is it gonna happen and then right in that split second between success and failure that's where that brilliance kicks in and mm-hmm. that chord would happen or that that decision to interpret a song out of nowhere would happen um the only thing that got in the way the only thing that got in the way of that concert and i'm, I'm not speaking out of turn the, the new york times review said the same thing is people that coughing. He kept, he kept stopping because of people coughing. Yeah, and I heard yeah. About that, like, yeah. and and he walked. He actually at Carnegie Hall walked off the stage, and his manager had to come out and say, "Everybody, he would love to continue, but you have to stop coughing." You know, Carnegie Hall is cough. I mean, New York. You go to a symphonic mm-hmm. venue in New York, and mm-hmm. it's almost like it's it's they have cough drops in the lobby. Like people are just we're New Yorkers mm-hmm. are fidgety. You know, we, we when we go to shows like. Whenever there's of course, a break hurry up, Kate. Yeah, exactly. Come on, yeah, yeah. come on, yeah, come on, yeah, come on. My, uh, my cough drop Finish is your solo out. already. Yeah, <laughs> finish your solo already. <laughs> oh Lord, he would never play in New York again if somebody yelled that. <laughs> ever yeah. or or maybe ever again in general. Yeah. Um, but but that that um, that Cologne concert um, is interesting because I read that he he almost didn't do it. He, have you heard about this? This was, nope. and it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting deep dive into the mind of somebody that brilliant and that temperamental, mm. and how the improvisational mind works when it's almost like there's no pressure. Like I think he was kind of having for him an off night at Carnegie Hall. Um, the, he, there's no, there's no such thing as an off night for him. Let's be clear. Know, but, but it, but it was Carnegie Hall, and people were coughing. He was agitated. Moments of brilliance did happen, but. It was like, oh, Keith Jarrett at Carnegie Hall, of course this is going to be brilliant. So I think for him there was this feeling of maybe it doesn't have to be, and you guys can all go screw yourselves. With Cologne, he, I, oh, here's what it was. He didn't have the piano he wanted. The piano that he wanted wasn't there. I don't know what it is that he plays. Whether it was, they, He wanted a Steinway, and they had a Bosendorf, or whatever it was. I don't know the details on that. But the piano that he specifically had flown in for the concert wasn't there. And so he told his manager, I'm not doing it. I'm not going. And for the mus- musos out there, if I'm messing up the story, please correct me. But I believe that that's what that that was the reason why he wasn't going to go on. The the festival organizers eventually convinced him, please, please, you're headlined, you're here, please go out and do this. And he went out with the most. This is not my piano. This is going to suck. Screw you guys. Like he really came went out with a bit of an anarchist feel that day of like, let right. me just get the hell out of Clone. And it wound up being one of the most iconic jazz recordings of all time. Yeah, but well, you know what? I think in our line of work, what do we, in those moments, like if we slip, if we slip up, we don't cut an artery. No, it's true. You know, that's true. We don't. You know, we look like a bit of a dick for a minute or two, and then it, and then it goes that's, back to normal. You know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But 
there's something about that Keith is is you know arguably the biggest influence on my songwriting because of oh, that wow. you know yeah. uh, have you read his book the sacred letters have not read sacred letters it's yet, like no. it's not it's not so much a book it's just you know like a collect well his book is a yeah. collection of yeah. things yeah um and in it he says you know you either see nothing as the absence of something or pregnant with everything ah uh, i love that that's great. I loved, I love that yeah. too. It's like you know, and that's you know the approach song. Like when you're coming to song, when you're coming at songwriting, to sit and yeah. to have any formula is not going to suit you well. Yeah, yeah. Certainly yeah. not I, me anyway. Just well, and I think that's been an interesting kind of side effect of this quarantine. And for those of us, I mean, you're you're very lucky that you get to have find that solitude. I think you know you you've you've found a slice of heaven for yourself regardless of all the rest that's going on in the world. You have you can go on tour, you can record, you can collaborate, and then you can kind of escape back to your spot of land that is your peace. Um, you know, I think for me, and you know, I talk about like, well, if you slip up, it's not like cutting an artery. You know, the pressure that I had from 16 years old, you know, being discovered by a mega producer, having to sing at very heady things, having to sing for an audience that was older, whatever it is, like, I, I kind of had ingrained in me at a very mm -hmm. impressionable age that it kind of was like cutting an artery that like that that you know at least mentally or emotionally or, or shame or anything like that like that if you don't if you if you do slip up and your fans notice that it's not you're not perfect or your voice isn't all that it should be or that you're not the person they think you are um, then it's yeah you know then then it is in many ways all over for you it took me many years in this business to find perspective, like real perspective, because the pressures were so great. And and now, of course, over the last 10 years or so, like I would 100% agree with you. Before that, I would be, <laughs> I'd be saying, but you know, what what's the difference? It is my blood, my blood is this, you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but, uh, but no, that's a, that's a great choice and a great, um, great artist to, uh, to to uh, to listen to on on our here our final our final moments over eggs and oh yeah i love it the, the head of that tune is just the, uh, the best ever anybody for anybody that you are influenced by for your songwriting is worth following in that wake because uh i'll say it here and i'll say it anywhere you, you are you are truly one of the one of the most beautiful soulful songwriters and singers i've ever heard in my life it was such an incredible honor for me for those that don't know that are listening to this that we got to collaborate and tour together and uh you fun. know it was it was it was just so meaningful for me because i had i had the pleasure of watching you every night you know i had the pleasure of standing at the side of the stage and 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 getting to hear you getting to hear that voice every night um and also getting to hear um your fans go nuts for you and also then my fans go nuts for you and uh, and I always love um, the education process too. Of like, if somebody's coming to you know hear you know whatever it is I do out there, uh, and you you come out first and say, you know, do what you do. If I, watching people's eyes and ears light up for your artistry every night was was my one of my favorite things i've experienced in touring uh, it was a, it was an absolute pleasure to, to be out on the road with you and uh Thank you, so man. just wanted to just wanted to get that in in our final moments because the asteroid is getting closer and yeah uh, it's getting closer, I Foy, it's getting closer. Foy, if i don't say it i'll never be i'll never get to say it uh, so <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> that's very sweet of you man very kind of you to say so thank you i am a bread pudding fan i right I you've had waffles for dinner. I've I've only had the eggs and the lox. So I I'm still craving some sweet bread. And uh, I love a I love a bread pudding. My dad got me into bread pudding. My dad's a big bread pudding fan. And every time right. we'd go out and there's bread pudding on the menu, he says you got to have a bite of this. So I I love like a bread pudding with a whiskey glaze sauce, like a a hearty like a croissanty bread pudding. Mm. Great scoop of vanilla ice cream. And a glass of uh, I would have some. Um, uh, it's like a like a dessert drink. I would have. A, um, oh, do you, you ever get into Japanese whiskey, Foy? Well, well I've I've drank uh, plenty of Japanese whiskey, but I I don't know <laughs> if I would know all the names of which one. Uh. <laughs> but but it's good, right? I mean, it's not sacrilege to say that it's they they make damn good whiskey over there. Oh, I mean, it's sacrilege for me to say that. I can't for say you that. to I say live it. In Scotland, right. man. I know, um, I know. You're in Scotland. You can't say it, but. Um, but I would do a glass of Hibiki 21 on the rocks. 
I'm going to go with you on the whiskey, actually, because, mm -hmm. yeah, the asteroid's coming. You may as well have a... Yeah, yeah, you know, big a surprise wee, for you. We bit of a buzz on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would have... I would have a cheese board, actually. Oh, I would have a cheese good, board. Yeah. You know, you know, like, uh, I, I think cheese. I chose this the other week, actually. I do like a cheese board, though, you know, just like a real yeah. nice array, and maybe some nice spicy chutney. Uh, oh, Spicy yeah. chutneys, tomato chutneys, red onion chutneys. Yeah. Nice biscuits, cheesy biscuits. I might go for that. Ooh. And uh, You put cheese on a cheesy biscuit? You animal. Yeah. Well, the little cheesy crackers, you know, like a... Yeah. A little cheese uh, on cheese. Uh, that's, that's, that's the... <laughs> that's, that's, that means cheesy cracker. A che <laughs> yeah. Is that cheesy cracker? Yeah, that's what it means. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. If you want one. Okay. I thought you were maybe milking a hamster. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hamster cheese on this cheesy cracker. Yeah. <laughs> Delicious. As yeah. rare as a Hibiki Twenty One, that hamster cheese. Yeah. As my final, as my final song, I have to say, Foy, as my, as my finishing, my final bread pudding and glass of whiskey, I would listen to probably one of my favorite pieces of classical music, "Pictures at an Exhibition" by um, uh, Mussorgsky. M Mussorgsky. Uh, this piece of music just makes me cry every time I listen to it. I feel like this. It's got hope. It's got life. It's got death. It's got everything in it uh, melodically, and uh, I would. Uh, I would cheers to you and listen to that, and then uh, over the credits uh, of all of this, I would play uh, "Always Look on the Bright Side of Life" by Monty Python. Uh, do you know what? I'm gonna go for uh, a song that you and I sang actually together, but the, not that not our version. Our version was a lot of fun to do. It was, but uh, "Bridge Over Troubled Water," but oh, Aretha yeah, Frank sure. Aretha Franklin's oh, yeah. version, absolutely from the Fillmore. Absolutely that. Uh, that to this day, that's the the best. It's just the best. Yeah, that's a that's a com that's a comforting song, and yeah. God knows we need comforting right now. A lot of the world we needs need, comforting right now. Fuck. We do, we do. Well, Floyd, thank you for having me on, and thank you for the comfort you provide in your artistry and uh, and conversation. And uh, I miss you, man. Let's get let's find ourselves on the same side of the pond when the dust settles, and uh, let's have a sing song Please and God. a drink and a cup of. I'd love to. You know I'm up for it. Uh, me too. Thank Your you, Your stash Jeff. is looking good as ever, my friend. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs>